Good morning, everyone, and welcome to TCQ's How to Prepare for a UST Investigation webinar. My name is Yvonne Rodriguez, and I will be your moderator. Accurate attendance information and survey results help us justify future webinars and other events. So if you want to see more from us, please complete the attendance form linked in the live event Q&A on the right side of your screen. If you don't see the Q&A, turn it on by clicking the question mark icon on the top right of the screen. We will now pause for about five minutes to allow you to complete the attendance form. Okay, let's begin. Attendees will not be able to speak during today's webinar, but you can use the Q&A to ask a question at any time. We will do our best to answer your questions in the Q&A and after each presentation. If we run out of time before we answer your question, or if you have a site-specific question, please email us at psthelp at tceq.texas.gov and we will communicate with you individually. Our presenters today are Rachel McMath and Rebecca Costigan both with our small business and local government assistance section. We will take about a 10 minute break between presentations. And now our first presenter, Rachel McMath. Thank you, Yvonne. Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today to learn about how to prepare for an underground storage tank investigation. Traditionally, we have given this presentation at small workshops across the state. However, since moving the presentation to a webinar format, we have been able to reach more people about UST compliance. As the moderator said, my name is Rachel McMath and I'm a Compliance Assistant Specialist with the Small Business and Local Government Assistance Section or SBLGA in our San Angelo Regional Office. My co-presenter is Becky Costigan. She is also a Compliance Assistant Specialist in our Houston Regional Office. If you have questions during this webinar, please feel free to submit them in the Q&A panel on the right side of the screen. Your questions will be moderated throughout the webinar. For site-specific questions, we encourage you to email us at psthelp at tceq.texas.gov or to call our toll-free compliance hotline number at 1-800-447-2827. Here's an overview of what we'll discuss today. We will go over some background information and talk about the different checklists used by in, during an investigation. Then we will discuss the investigation process and what happens if you receive violations. We'll talk about the assistance we provide at SBLGA and direct you to resources that you may find helpful. But our main topic today will be going through the contents of the UST Compliance Notebook, which has instructions and examples of records that are needed to show compliance. We'll have a brief Q&A session about halfway through the webinar before taking a short break and switching presenters. When we get back from the break, Becky will finish going over the UST Compliance Notebook, and she will also talk about how to request records from the TCEQ. After she's done presenting, we will have another Q&A session, so please remember to post your questions in the Q&A panel. Let's start with a little background information. The Energy Policy Act of 2005 requires all states to inspect all underground storage tanks every three years. There are over 21,000 underground storage tank facilities in Texas, which means that TCEQ and its contractors are required to do about 7,000 inspections each year. These inspections typically result in a fair number of violations. In fiscal year 2022, we had over 252 administrative orders filed against PST facilities with an average penalty of about $8,619. Our hope is by doing these webinars, we reduce these numbers by giving PST facilities the tools they need to be in compliance before an investigation occurs. 
So there are three different compliance checklists that an investigator could use during an inspection. The Energy Act checklist is a focused 10 point checklist based on the Energy Act of 2005. This means it only hits the high points in the rules. However, you must still be compliant with all of the rules that apply to your facility because an investigator could choose to use a different checklist, such as the Modified Compliance Evaluation Investigation or CEI Mod checklist. This checklist covers the same regulations, but it is more in depth and covers about 40 points. There is also a checklist specific to tanks and facilities that are temporarily out of service. So you will need to be ready for any checklist that applies to you. These checklists are available online and you can access them on our PST compliance resources web pages. Uh, we'll talk about how to find those later. Investigations can either be announced or unannounced. If it's an announced investigation, you'll normally get between one to two weeks notice. The investigation will consist of a records review and an on-site inspection. The investigator may request to see your records whenever they schedule the investigation, or they may ask that you have them available on site at the time of the investigation. If the TCEQ receives a complaint regarding your facility, complaint investigations are required to be conducted unannounced and within 30 days of receiving that complaint. So the fact that an investigator could show up at your facility unannounced is a good reason why you always want to maintain your records and be in compliance. If violations are noted during the investigation of your facility, the investigator will give you an exit energy interview form outlining those violations. Violations are classified into categories A, B, and C. Category A violations are the most severe in terms of their threat to human health or the environment. These require automatic initiation of formal enforcement action and you will receive a notice of enforcement. Our enforcement division will then assess a penalty. Category B violations will be given a notice of violation and establish a compliance deadline. If you do not resolve your category B violations within that time frame, they will be referred to enforcement. Category C violations are the least stringent and are usually cited for partial non-compliance, but they also receive notices of violation. You could also receive a field citation. These are only issued for certain category A violations. There are a few benefits of field citations over formal enforcement, mainly that they are processed more quickly and there is a reduced penalty. So if any violations are noted during an investigation of your facility, you are required to get into compliance. You will want to submit compliance documentation as soon as possible because this could reduce potential penalties. So regarding penalties, we are often asked how much a penalty will be, but unfortunately we don't know. Penalties are calculated by the enforcement coordinator that's assigned to your case and several different factors go into their penalty calculation. So they will consider the amount of throughput or how much product is dispensed on average and they'll look at your compliance history. They will also consider any avoided costs or economic benefit, which is money that you saved by not complying with the rules. So for example, if you failed to have the cathodic protection system tested, the money that you saved by not paying for the test would be considered an avoided cost and will be included in your penalty calculation. However, there are a couple ways to reduce your penalty amounts. The enforcement coordinator will look at your efforts to get back into compliance and if those efforts were done quickly and well, which could result in a good faith reduction. There can be a 25% reduction with this route, which is why you want to fix any issues and submit your compliance documentation as soon as possible. The other reduction method is for a deferral for agreeing to an order. Agreed orders are when you as the respondent agree to the terms and conditions that enforcement lays out and offers an expedited settlement. There can be a 20% reduction with this route.
Now I'm going to talk about our section, SBLGA, and resources that are available to you. SBLGA offers confidential compliance assistance without the threat of enforcement. We develop guidance documents like the UST Compliance Notebook and PST Super Guide, and we have lots of helpful information on our webpage, www.texasenviralhelp.org. If you have questions, you can call our compliance hotline number 1-800-447-2827 and compliance assistance specialists across the state monitor this hotline every day that the agency is open. We have compliance assistance specialists in all of our regional offices that can help you with your questions about environmental rules and regulations. We can talk with you over the phone, but we can also schedule time to meet with you in person, either in our office or at your facility. We have an environmenter program. Environmenters are qualified professionals who volunteer their time to help our customers with with technical issues such as resolving violations, understanding the rules, and assisting with record keeping. So if you're interested in receiving help from an environmenter, contact your local compliance assistance specialist to discuss if you qualify and how to submit a request. And then we also have our advocate article. This is a free email newsletter that provides information on rule changes and upcoming events or webinars. Many of you probably received the advocate article that announced this webinar and where to register for it. So if you aren't already subscribed, you can do so on our website or contact us and we can help sign you up. Here are some PST specific resources and guidance that we have created. Our PST compliance resources webpage, uh, shown in the screenshot, was updated last year. It is now a central webpage with links to a series of web pages that break down individual PST compliance topics. You can also find links to our guidance documents that are listed on this slide. So the first document, the USC Compliance Notebook or RG 543 is what we'll be going through today. It is primarily a record keeping tool for you as the owner or operator to organize and keep track of your records. However, you will notice that there are also links to information and resources and instructions for the various operating requirements as well. Then there is our PST Super Guide or RG 475, which is a plain language technical guide to the PST rules. It is broken down by topic into 15 different modules, so you can access a specific module based on the information you need. You can also find a link to it and its web address on the instructions page of your UST Compliance Notebook. We are currently in the process of updating our super guide, but it will remain available online while we are revising it. Uh, be sure to check those modules regularly to get the most up to date version. And I highly recommend you read this guidance document because it includes a lot of useful information that may not be covered in this webinar. Then last but not least, our PST rules summary goes over the PST rule changes that went into effect in 2018. It is set up as a table so that you can see the different rule citations and the basic description of what changes were made. Steers. STEERS stands for the State of Texas Environmental Electronic Reporting System, which is our online electronic permitting program. So you can use it to submit initial registrations, annual self-certifications, construction notices, and update any owner operator information or system details. Uh, the benefit to using STEERS is mainly that it will save you time. When you submit something in STEERS, it goes immediately to the PST registration section for review and the processing time is cut down, meaning you can receive your delivery certificates much faster. Creating a STEERS account. We have created a guidance documents called a guide to creating an account in STEERS e-permitting, RG531A, that will take you step by step through the process on how to create a STEERS account with screenshots that you can follow. We also have a video tutorial on YouTube called how to set up an account in STEERS that will take you through the process as well. 
To access the PST forms in STEERS, you must add the Petroleum Storage Tank Registrations Program to your account during the account setup, or you can add it to an existing account if you've already created one for other TCEQ program applications. So if you have trouble creating your account, adding the PST registration program, or filling out one of the online forms, please call our compliance, compliance hotline and we can assist you. Let's get into the notebook. We developed the UST Compliance Notebook as a record keeping tool to help you maintain compliance and have your records readily available at your site. We updated it last year to reflect the 2018 rule updates, give it a fresher look and meet accessibility standards. The notebook includes example records to help you know what the investigators are looking for. It also has blank log sheets with instructions that you can use. We recommend that you put this notebook in a three ring binder and keep it at your facility so that all your records will be in one place and readily available when your facility is inspected. You'll see that the first couple of pages are instructions on how to use the notebook, request records, where to find forms, where to access online resources, and the rules that apply to PSTs. After those instructions, you will see a list of rule citations. TCEQ rules are found under Title 30 of the Texas Administrative Code, and Chapter 334 contains most of the PST rules. However, Chapter 37 has the rules on financial assurance, and Chapters 115 and 113 have the vapor recovery rules. In general, you will need to keep your records for five years or as long as the equipment is in use, and all installation records need to be kept for the lifetime of the system. The original installation documentation is valuable and can be very difficult to replace if they are lost. If you look at the notebook, you will see that it is broken down into different sections, each with their own instructions and information. The sections of the notebook include registration, self-certification, financial assurance, corrosion protection, release detection, spill and overfill prevention, and more. One of the updates that we made to the notebook is we removed the tabs between sections. However, the notebook pages are numbered and we added a table of contents for easy navigation. As we go through the sections, we will discuss what the requirements are and what records you need to maintain to stay in compliance with the rules. All right, so let's go through the notebook and discuss the records needed for each section. Uh, we will start with registration and self-certification. All underground storage tanks that contain or have contained a regulated substance must be registered with the TCEQ. And all underground storage tanks that contain motor fuel are required to self-certify every year. Motor fuels include motor gasoline, diesel fuel, or any blend containing one or more of those substances. If there are any changes to the system, including a change of ownership, tank status, or say switching release detection methods, you will need to report those changes within 30 days. You can use the registration and self-certification form, form 0724, or STEERS to update that information. It's also very important to keep your contact information updated because the information on your registration is what the investigators will use to notify you of a scheduled investigation. If your contact information isn't up to date, you may not receive that notification. You will need to keep copies of all registration and self-certification forms that you've submitted or the copies of STEERS submissions confirmations from the past five years. You will need to keep a copy of your current registration certificate and a copy of your current delivery certificate as well. The delivery certificate is what is issued after you submit your annual self-certification form and it is required to be visibly posted at your facility. So as you may know, you are not allowed to get fuel deliveries without a valid delivery certificate. 
if you are installing new tanks or are bringing tanks that were temporarily out of service back into service, you must submit a construction notification. PST registration will send an acknowledgement letter which can serve as a temporary delivery authorization. A temporary delivery authorization is good for 90 days from the first delivery. Becky will go over construction notifications in her presentation. One important thing to note is that tanks and compartments are required to be physically numbered on site and that numbering must match up with how you numbered your tanks and compartments on your registration form. These labels are required to be legible and permanent, so if you choose to spray paint the numbers of your tanks and compartments, make sure that you reapply as necessary so that it remains legible. And then here's a photo showing a tank numbered as one at a facility. For compartmental tanks, label the compartments to match your registration. So here are pictures showing how a facil facility labeled their compartmental tank as 2A and as 2B. Here is the registration and self-certification form or form 0724. Uh, as I mentioned, you can submit this information through STEERS as well. However, TCEQ will still accept mailed or faxed forms and documents. So if you would like to use paper forms, you can find them on our website. And remember the notebook uh, provides information on how to find our forms on our website. And in the notebook, we have also provided you with an example delivery certificate. So make sure your delivery certificate is up to date and clearly posted at your facility. The next section in the notebook is financial assurance. And this is where you can keep all of your financial assurance records. You are required to have enough financial assurance to cover corrective action, which is the cleanup of a release, and to cover third party liability, which would be bodily injury and property damage caused by a release or an accident. The most common amounts of financial assurance that are required are $1 million per occurrence and $1 million per annual aggregate. Annual aggregate is the total amount required for all leaks that might occur within one year. So please note that these coverage amounts are the most commonly required, but depending on your facility and throughput, the rules may require different minimum coverage amounts. You can contact us if you need help figuring out how much coverage you need, and we can help you look through the rules to find that information. The most common method used for financial assurance is an insurance policy, but other forms of acceptable financial assurance include a letter of credit, a surety bond, self-insurance, or a financial test, and a combination of methods is allowed to achieve your required coverage amount. You will need to keep current records of your certificate of insurance or your proof of other financial assurance, such as a letter of credit. Uh, you are required to submit a copy of your current financial assurance along with your annual self-certification form. Otherwise, you will not receive a delivery certificate. So as I mentioned before, you can renew your self-certification and upload your financial assurance documentation through STEERS. If you look in the notebook, you will see that we have provided you with an example certificate of insurance. During an investigation, the investigator will want to see the endorsement page for the tanks that are covered by your policy. Let's move on to the next section of the notebook corrosion protection. Underground storage tank systems are required to be protected from corrosion so that they don't end up like the tanks in this photo. The corrosion protection requirements depend on the material of the system components like tanks, piping, fittings, or valves. 
You must protect all underground and underwater metal components from corrosion, and again, material is what determines the requirements. There are different acceptable methods of corrosion protection, such as having tanks and piping made from non-corrodible material, such as fiberglass reinforced plastic or FRP. Electrically isolate metal components from contact with soil and water. Coating or cladding steel tanks with composite or FRP material. Uh, this method does not extend to piping or other system components. And cathodic protection. The picture on the right shows a fiberglass tank installation. There are two types of cathodic protection, galvanic systems or impressed current systems. Galvanic systems use sacrificial anodes connected to metal components so that the anode corrodes instead of the component. Impressed current systems use a rectifier to send an electronic current to the system through attached anodes to prevent corrosion. Cathodic protection systems must be tested at installation three to six months after installation and then every three years after that. These tests must be conducted by a qualified corrosion specialist or corrosion technician. And then the rectifier for impressed current systems must also be inspected every 60 days to make sure it is working properly. Um, and that rectifier test can be done by the owner or operator. As I mentioned, if you have an impressed current system, the rectifier is required to operate continuously and you need to inspect it every 60 days. So this is a picture of the example log we have provided in the notebook that you can use to maintain those records. When you're taking those readings, you'll want to ensure that the amps and volts are close to what the system was designed for as shown on on your most recent cathodic protection test. If you see any abnormalities in these readings, you will need to contact a corrosion protection specialist to evaluate your system. So let's talk about sumps for a minute. As I mentioned, corrosion protection can be achieved by isolating components from soil and water. This example shows two different containment sumps where the pump is protected from the surrounding backfill by a plastic containment structure. So again, the rules say that any metal component that comes into contact with backfill or water needs to be protected from corrosion. In the photo on the left, these metal components are considered to be electrically isolated because they are not in contact with soil or water. You are required to keep these sumps clean and dry to meet the corrosion protection requirements by isolation. So as you can see in the photo on the right, these metal components are not isolated because the sump is filled with water. Similarly, the metal components would not be considered isolated if the sump had been filled with soil or backfill. So if you cannot keep metal components from coming into contact with soil or water, your system needs to have some other form of corrosion protection, like installing a cathodic protection system to protect those non-isolated metal components. If you have FRP tanks and piping or a composite clad or jacketed steel tanks, then you will need to keep all installation records regarding the corrosion protection, such as an original invoice or delivery manifest. If you don't have installation records, then a written statement from a qualified corrosion specialist certifying that the tank and piping meet corrosion protection requirements may be accepted. For components that require cathodic protection, you must keep all installation records, which could be the cathodic protection system design and information from the manufacturer or corrosion specialist who installed it. You must also keep the results of the initial test, three to six month test, and three year test. And if applicable, the results of the 60 day rectifier test. The thing to remember is you need to have records to prove the construction material and show that the components make, meet the corrosion protection requirements.
if you don't have installation records, you can have a corrosion technician or corrosion specialist verify the system's construction material and obtain documentation for your records. One way a corrosion specialist can verify is to conduct a visual inspection. So here are photos showing FRP tank ribs. If you look at the picture on the left, you can see the white arrows pointing to the FRP tank ribs through the sump. That is a way to visually verify the construction material. The picture on the right is showing you the inside of an FRP tank by a camera survey, which is another way to visually verify the construction material. The white arrows are pointing to the FRP tank ribs in that photo as well. If a visual inspection is not possible, another verification method that corrosion technicians or specialists can use is a structure to soil test. So here's an example of these test results that we have provided in your notebook. The corrosion technician or specialist will then provide you with documentation verifying the system's construction material. This comprehensive UST system survey is an example of the documentation you could receive for your records. Uh, you may not be able to see this example very well, but it has also been provided to you in the notebook. So let's go to the next section of the notebook, which is tank release detection. All underground storage tanks in Texas are required to be monitored for leaks every 30 days. This means you cannot go more than 30 days between passing test results. There are several different approved methods of release detection, but no matter which method you use, it must be able to detect a release of 0.2 gallons per hour. It must also be conducted in accordance with third party certification for that method of release detection. You can look up third party certifications at the National Work Group on Leak Detection Evaluations website, nwglde.org. All release detection records must be kept for a minimum of five years. You must also conduct a 30 day walkthrough inspection of your release detection equipment. This is separate from your release detection monitoring, but they can be done at the same time. This walkthrough inspection includes checking your alarms, looking for any unusual operating conditions and reviewing your release detection records. Unusual operating conditions could include unexplained water in the tank or erratic behavior of dispensing equipment. We provide an example log in the notebook that you may use to record your 30 day walkthrough inspection. You do not have to use the logs we provide, but if you use your own, you must make sure you are recording all the required information. You must also conduct an annual test of your release detection equipment. This test is to make sure release detection equipment that was installed as a part of the UST system is operating properly. It must be conducted in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions or a code of practice set by a nationally recognized association. So this includes equipment such as the automatic tank gauge, probes and sensors, automatic line leak detector or ALLD uh, vacuum pumps and pressure gauges and electronic equipment used for groundwater or vapor monitoring. You must also conduct an annual walkthrough inspection of your handheld release detection equipment. The annual walkthrough inspection includes checking that your handheld equipment is operational, such as your tank gauge sticks or groundwater balers. 
So here's the log that we have created that you can use to record both the annual test and walkthrough results. Note that the space for the annual walkthrough inspection of handheld equipment is that last listed row. Uh, we have left a couple of blank rows for you to use to include any additional release detection equipment not already listed. So on to release detection methods. Let's start by talking about the two most common methods of release detection, automatic tank gauging or ATG with inventory control and statistical inventory reconciliation or SIR with inventory control. For ATG with inventory control, you need to have a record of at least one passing ATG test every 30 days and your records of your 30 day inventory control with reconciliation. There is an exception in the rules that applies to only emergency generator tanks and use oil tanks, so they may use an ATG for release detection without having to do the 30 day inventory control. For SIR with inventory control, you need passing results from your SIR vendor no more than 30 days apart, and you must receive those results no more than 15 days after the last day of that 30 day monitoring period. So you also need to have records of your 30 day inventory control with reconciliation. So just keep in mind that even though you are using an ATG or an SIR vendor for release detection, they are not standalone methods, meaning that these methods must be paired with inventory control to be a valid method of release detection. These may be a little hard to read, but here are some example ATG test printouts. When an investigator comes to your facility, they will be looking for a passing test that is no more than 30 days from the previous passing test. So looking at the ATG printouts at the top of the page, they say leak test results 0 0.20 gallons per hour test invalid. And then it says low level test error, percent volume too low. Those tests would not be sufficient to show compliance. But if you look at the ATG printouts at the bottom of the page, they say leak test results 0 0.20 gallons per hour test pass. So the, those would be acceptable records and would be sufficient to show compliance. The notebook also has an example of SIR results. In this example, the SIR vendor wrote on the side, fail slash inconclusive, must fill out suspected release form and research problem. So this test record would actually not be sufficient to show compliance for the tank because it is not a passing test. So this would need, need to be reported to TCEQ as a suspected release, which Becky will be going over in her presentation. Going back to inventory control for just a bit, in the notebook and on our PST compliance resources webpage, we provide inventory control worksheets for blended fuels and non-blended fuels. These worksheets are interactive and were developed based on the EPA guidance called Doing Inventory Control Right for Underground Storage Tanks, uh, which we have linked in the notebook and on our PST compliance resources webpage as well. Uh, previous versions of our compliance notebook included example logs that were pulled directly from this EPA guidance. We have removed those and instead link to the inventory control worksheets we have developed. And here is what that page in the notebook looks like with the links to the worksheets and the EPA guidance. Um, if you need assistance finding them on our web web page, please call us or send us an email. Also note, if you are a retail facility where fuel products are sold to the public, you are required to perform 30 day inventory control with reconciliation regardless of your chosen release detection method.
So like I've been saying, inventory control and reconciliation must be done every 30 days. Here is a screenshot of the bottom of our inventory control worksheets. You should see this section called 30 day calculations for the reconciliation portion portion, also called the leak check. The rule is if your inventory control fails the leak check two months in a row, you must report this as a suspected release to TCEQ. Um, and as I have mentioned, Becky will talk more about reporting suspected releases in her presentation. Moving on to the next release detection method, interstitial monitoring. This monitors the interstitial space between double walled tanks or piping for releases. If your tanks and piping were installed on or after January 1st, 2009, interstitial monitoring must be your primary form of release detection. So if you use interstitial monitoring or are required to use this method, check your sensors at least once every 30 days and keep records of the results. The notebook has a blank interstitial monitoring log that you can use to keep records of your 30 day monitoring results. The sensor status should be normal at least once every 30 days. So if you're using your own log or record keeping system, just make sure you're documenting the required information. Another method of release detection is monitoring groundwater wells for the presence of floating or dissolved free product or monitoring vapor wells for regulated substance vapor. Inspect the wells every 30 days and keep records of your results. Also keep a record from the well installer stating that a release from any part of the system will be detected in at least 30 days. So here is the groundwater and vapor monitoring log provided in the notebook that you can use. You will record the depth from the top of the well to the top of the groundwater or vapor reading and note if there was any free product or vapors detected. Um, the notebook includes more and in, more detailed instructions for this. If you use a secondary containment barrier um, around your UST system as your release detection, you must monitor the excavation zone for any presence of regulated substances, liquids or vapors every 30 days. Keep records of the results. And so again, we have provided a blank secondary containment barrier monitoring log where you can document if any free product was detected by sensors or in the observation wells. The last two methods we'll talk about are not allowed for every facility. You can only use manual tank gauging as a release detection method for tanks that are 1000 gallons or less. If you use manual tank gauging, you must test the tank weekly and get a monthly average. So keep records showing your monitoring results. In the notebook, we provide a table showing the required test durations, weekly standards, and monthly standards for the tests. Here are the example logs we provide for the weekly and monthly tests. For the weekly tests, you will get an average of multiple stick readings and convert that average to gallons. You will subtract the final gallons from the initial to get the test results. For the monthly log sheet, you will use your weekly results to get your monthly averages. Uh, more detailed instructions for this are in the notebook. But if your weekly or monthly results are greater than the standards provided in the notebook instructions table, you may have a suspected release. And then finally, 30 day tank gauging is only allowed as a release detection method for tanks that are associated with emergency generators. So if you have an emergency generator that's using 30 day tank gauging as its release detection method, make sure you keep records showing your 30 day monitoring results. 
This testing is similar to the manual tank gauging process. However, it is only done every 30 days instead of weekly, and we provide a table with the test standards and more indeed and more detailed instructions in the notebook. So it's about time for our first Q&A session and break. I think by now you've probably realized that the name of the game is record keeping. Uh, now that you have this notebook, put it in a three ring binder and use it to maintain your records all in one place. We are always willing to answer any questions you have on maintaining compliance, so please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A panel, call our hotline number, or email us at psthelp at tceq.texas.gov. And then don't forget, we also have regional compliance assistance specialists to help you and our PSC compliance resources webpage that has helpful information, tools, and guidance documents. So with that, I will turn things back over to the moderator to see if we have any questions. OK, thank you, Rachel. We will now take a few moments to answer questions, and we do already have a couple. So if you're ready, Rachel, I'll read them out. Sounds good. My OK. My TCEQ inspector has been suggesting to do gross amount as fuel delivery and daily inventory. But over the years, we all have been doing. Um, thought the net amount, which one is right? OK, so yes, that's a good question, um, but it is the the gross delivery amount. Um, the EPA guidance that doing inventory control right goes into more detail and we follow that EPA guidance for inventory control. So um, if you need help finding it on our web pages, um, let us know, but you can access it either through the compliance notebook or through um, our web pages. And I believe it's when that guidance kind of goes through um, more details about inventory control, it, it says to use the gross delivery amount. OK, our second question. If a facility has received an NOV, but we have already begun corrective actions to show three consecutive months of compliance in coordination with the investigator, does this interfere with submitting our annual self certification through STEERS? OK, that is a really good question. Um, so when I was looking at um, the paper form, that form 0724, um, in that self-certification section, it uh, says if you say yes to meeting those uh, technical standards that you are indicating that you meet the reporting and record keeping requirements for the 60 days prior to your self-certification. So I think if you have three consecutive months of compliance, that should not um, prohibit you from being able to submit your self-certification. However, it may also depend on the types of violations you received. So if those violations were those category A and were referred to enforcement, you may have penalties associated with those violations. So you are still required or you are still responsible for paying those penalties. And there's a chance that that penalty amount may prohibit you from being able to submit um, your self certification, at least in STEERS. Um, but whoever submitted that question, if you could please email us at that PST help at tceq.texas.gov, um, we will reach out to the right people uh, to get that answer for you so that we can confirm whether or not um, that would prohibit you from using STEERS or prohibit you from submitting your self certification. OK, thanks, Rachel. And we have a follow up from the previous question from Omar. He states the gross amount never works out as record keeping. The numbers get all over. Hmm. Well, that could be that could indicate a couple different things. Um, please reach out to us at that PST help. Um, 
so that we can kind of go into that with you a little bit more. Um, maybe something about the math is wrong, um, but that's that's something that if your inventory control fails two consecutive months in a row, um, whether it's an actual leak or maybe if it's just something wrong with the math, you are required to uh, report that as a suspected release and kind of go through that investigation process to determine what's going on there. So if your, your gross delivery amounts aren't working out, please email us because we want to make sure that that um, isn't actually indicating that you have a leak. So yes, please reach out to us so we can follow up with you on that. Okay, I'm not seeing any further questions currently. Do you want to wait a few more minutes? I say let's go ahead and uh, we can take our break, but if you have questions, send them in and we can, we'll, we'll address them maybe after the break. Okay, everyone, we will now take a 10 minute break. Please be back at about a little before 10 10, so about maybe 10 08 or so. Thank you. Okay, welcome back, everyone. I just want to everyone to please fill out the attendance form. I put another link in the QA. Um, it's important for us to know who all attended, so we appreciate it. And now, our second half of the webinar. Our presenter is Rebecca Costigan. Please take it away, Rebecca. Hello, everyone. My name is Becky Costigan, and I will be presenting the second half of the webinar today. Let's start with piping release detection requirements. Did you know that your piping also requires release detection? Without piping release detection, how do you know if your petroleum product is staying in your pipes or if it is leaking? This slide has a picture of a pipe that had product leaking from the inside and degraded the pipe from the inside out. This ultimately caused petroleum product to leak into the surrounding soil. Therefore, it's important to make sure you have piping release detection to prevent releases or to detect them quickly to minimize any impact to the environment. What are the requirements for piping release detection? Well, there are two types of piping, pressurized piping and suction piping, and each type of piping has its own requirements. Pressurized piping needs two types of release detection. All pressurized systems must have a line leak detector monitoring each line at a three gallon per hour rate. In addition to the line leak detector, facilities that have pressurized piping must also have another form of piping release detection. They can choose either a 30 day release detection method that measures at 0.2 gallon per hour rate or an annual tightness test measuring at 0.1 gallon per hour. And while it's not a release detection method, it's important to mention that these facilities must also have shear valves installed for each line. These can be visually verified by an investigator when they, are, when they visit the facility. The other type of piping is called suction piping. This type of piping only needs one form of release detection. They can either choose a 30 day monitoring method that tests at a 0.2 gallon per hour rate or a tightness test every three years that measures at 0.1 gallon per hour. Whatever method you choose, make sure it's conducted in accordance with third party certification requirements. The pressurized piping systems must keep the following records to prove compliance. All facilities with pressurized piping must have an annual line leak detector function test to ensure that these devices are able to detect a three gallon per hour leak. Additionally, these facilities must keep records to show compliance with their second piping release detection method. This could be any of the following listed on this slide. The most common method is the annual piping tightness test. 
Alternatively, these facilities could choose one of the 30 day release detection methods, such as vapor groundwater monitoring, interstitial monitoring, SIR with inventory control, or an electronic leak monitor. There are quite a few options, so make sure to keep records to prove you are in compliance with the release detection method you choose. For facilities with suction piping systems, they need to keep records to show compliance with their one piping release detection method that they choose. This could include any of the following, a three-year piping tightness test record, or one of the 30-day release detection methods, including vapor groundwater monitoring, interstitial monitoring, or SIR with inventory control. Now there is a certain type of suction piping that has a high mounted check valve located on the suction line. This type of piping does not require piping release detection because the product will not stay in the piping. If you have this type of suction piping, you must provide documentation or as built drawings to prove that you have this type of piping. It's not very common, so it's important to have this documentation to prove compliance during an investigation. If you want a short summary of these requirements, you're in luck. You can look at the piping release detection section in the underground storage tank compliance notebook, and you will find this table, which summarizes the release detection methods for piping. It has the piping release detection method on the left, that requires the required records in the middle and the monitoring frequency on the right. The next two slides are examples of line link detector annual function tests. Remember the line link detector is a requirement for all pressurized piping systems. This is a mechanical non-electronic line link detector function test result which checked three piping lines, each separate line link detector, and luckily they all say pass. This picture is an example of an electronic line leak detector test. And notice the line leak detector has a three gallon per hour leak check rate. This slide shows a passing piping tightness test. Remember that for piping tightness tests, it is an option for pressurized piping systems every year or for facilities with suction piping every three years. Now, as for the other 30 day release detection methods, including groundwater vapor monitoring, SIR with inventory control, you can use the same examples that are in the compliance notebook under the tank release detection section. The photo on this slide shows three shear valves. There are three lines, each with their own shear valve. The investigator will visually verify to make sure that these are properly anchored and here they are anchored with a metal crossbar. Moving on to the next section in the compliance notebook, we are going to discuss the requirements for spill prevention equipment and overfill devices. The photos on this slide show the tight fill fitting on the left, the spill bucket in the middle, and a fill port cap that goes over the fill tube on the right. This equipment ensures that your system is liquid tight during product transfers and minimizes any chances of water and debris from going into your tanks. These are just some of the spill and overfill prevention requirements facilities must maintain. Here is a helpful summary of all the spill and overfill equipment requirements. You can find this table in the Underground Storage Tank Compliance Notebook spill and overfill prevention section. If you look at the table, the column on the left 
is the type of equipment. The column in the middle explains the required records for that type of equipment. And the column on the right explains the frequency that you should be maintaining this type of equipment. We'll be covering the spill bucket requirements, different requirements for containment sumps, and requirements for overfill prevention. Let's start with the requirements for your spill prevention equipment. Facilities are required to have a tight fill fitting, making it liquid tight between fueling transfers. Facilities must also have a liquid tight spill bucket to catch spills and prevent debris and liquids such as rainwater from going into the tank. Starting January 1st, 2021, all facilities had to meet new requirements which increased the frequency of spill prevention equipment inspections. Now spill buckets must be inspected for integrity every 30 days and debris and liquid found in the spill bucket must be removed within 96 hours. Additionally, these new rules added a three year tightness test requirement to spill prevention equipment. The tightness testing can be conducted using vacuum, pressure, or liquid testing in accordance with manufacturer guidelines, a code of practice, or a low liquid level test method. If the spill prevention equipment is double walled, then those facilities have an option of the double walled spill prevention equipment during the 30 day walkthrough inspections, but they do not have to conduct tightness testing. It's important that these facilities with double walled spill buckets have documentation to show their spill prevention equipment is double walled and included on the 30 day walkthrough inspection so they can opt out of the three year tightness testing requirement. All containment sumps, submersible turbine pumps, and under dispenser containment areas must also be periodically monitored every year. Now, the type of sump determines how you should conduct this annual inspection. For example, if your facility that has a containment sump with interstitial monitoring, you need to check for leaks in the interstitial area, remove any liquid or debris within 96 hours, and make sure it's properly disposed of. If your facility has a containment sump not using interstitial monitoring or they are uncontained, you need to check for damage to equipment, releases to the environment, and corrosion protection for any metal components that contain product while also surrounded by soil or water. In addition to these annual inspections, any containment sumps used for interstitial monitoring of piping where interstitial monitoring is the primary form of release detection. Those sumps must also be tested for tightness every three years using vacuum, pressure, or liquid tightness testing. However, if these containment sumps used for interstitial monitoring are double walled and the facility can choose to monitor these containment sumps during the 30-day walkthrough inspection, without conducting the three-year tightness test. And keep in mind that when you do any repairs to your spill or overfill equipment, it must be tested within 30 days of the repair to show that it is working properly. To prove you're in compliance, Make sure to keep records of the spill prevention equipment inspection that is being completed within the 30-day time frame. If you find liquid, soil, or debris during the inspection, make sure to remove it within 96 hours and keep documentation to show proper disposal. If your facility has single-walled spill buckets, you also need to conduct and keep records of the three-year tightness test. If your facility has double walled spill buckets and you are not conducting the three year tightness test, make sure that the spill buckets are inspected during the 30 day walkthrough 
and that you have documentation to show your equipment is double walled. As for sumps, remember all sumps, submersible turbine pumps, and under dispenser containment areas must be inspected on an annual basis. Be sure to keep documentation to prove compliance with this annual inspection. Any sumps used with interstitial monitoring of piping, where interstitial monitoring is the primary release detection method, these sumps need to be tightness tested every three years or be double walled and included in the 30 day walkthrough inspection. All of these records must be kept for at least five years. If your facility conducts the tightness test with liquid tightness testing, the resulting liquids must be managed appropriately. Some options for disposal are discussed on this slide. While the liquids can be reused for further liquid testing in other sumps at the same or at a different facility, you will eventually have to dispose of the test liquid. One option is to capture, pump, and haul it for proper disposal at an authorized wastewater treatment plant. You need to check with them and ask if they will accept the wastewater first. You can ask your municipality for information about the nearest wastewater treatment plant, or you can search for the nearest outfall on the TCEQ outfalls map. The map only provides the name and permit information about the facility, so you will need to do a little research to find their contact information and to ask if they will accept this test water. If you would like assistance with this, you can also call the Small Business Hotline to get help from a compliance specialist. Other options for disposal include discharging these to waters of the state in accordance with the water quality general permits, either the hydrostatic test water general permit or the petroleum fuel or petroleum substances general permit. It's extremely important that if you do discharge under either of these general permits, that you understand the specific requirements to discharge your test water. For additional information, see the TCEQ webpage, Available Water Quality General Permits, which is listed on this slide. Here is an example of a spill bucket inspection document that you can use to record your spill bucket inspection. Remember to inspect the condition of the spill bucket, look for cracks, liquid and debris, and remove it within 96 hours. This inspection should be conducted every 30 days. This is an example form for containment sump inspections. These inspections are conducted annually and you're checking the integrity of the sumps, if they're damaged, if there's any leaks to the environment, or releases just like the spill bucket inspection, and remove any liquid or debris found within 96 hours and properly dispose of it. And this is example documentation for proper disposal spill bucket waste. Remember, you must keep documentation for the past five years to show your compliance with these regulations. For overfill devices, facilities have two options for compliance. The first option is the automatic shutoff device, also known as the flapper valve, which should be set to activate at 95% capacity. The second option for compliance is a flow restrictor, which is also known as a ball float. This should be set to activate at 90% capacity. Keep in mind, this activation level varies on the type of overfill device you have and if the overfill device is equipped with an audible or visible alarm. On this slide, I wanna highlight a couple new requirements for overfill devices. Facilities are no longer able to repair or replace flow restrictors 
after September 1st, 2018. If you currently have a flow restrictor, you can continue to use it until it requires being repaired or replaced. At that point, you will need to install an automatic shutoff device. The other requirement is a three-year test on overfill devices to check that they are working properly and will activate at the appropriate level. All facilities should have conducted their first three-year overfill test by January 1, 2021. After the initial test, all facilities must re retest their overfill equipment every three years. Since record keeping is the name of the game, let's discuss what records you need to document compliance with overfill prevention. If you have an automatic shutoff device, which is pictured on the left of the slide, this device is in the fill port or fill tube, so it can be visually verified by an investigator. However, it's always a good idea to keep installation records which may also prove that the device is set at the appropriate level. Within 30 days of a repair, you must test the equipment to ensure it's operating properly. So keep records of any repairs and three-year test results. The flow restrictor, which is pictured on the right of the slide, is in the vent line and it's harder to see. That means installation records should be kept as proof that your facility meets the overfill prevention requirements. Have the three-year testing results and keep those records as well. Keep in mind that this overfill device cannot be repaired or replaced after September 1st, 2018. Now the next section in the compliance notebook discusses reporting suspected releases. Looking at the picture in this slide makes me think that this may be something that's reportable to the TCEQ. A suspected release occurs when a facility receives a failed or inconclusive release detection result. This could be the 30-day ATG or SIR reports, or interstitial monitoring and secondary containment sensors are not normal, or if inventory control fails for two consecutive 30-day periods. You need to report this information to the TCEQ and take steps to figure out what is going on with your system. If your facility experiences a suspected release, you need to report this information to the TCEQ Remediation Division within 24 hours. You must mention the date of the suspected release, the date the owner and operator became aware of the release, and you can call or fax this information on the TCEQ's incident report form. After your initial report, you need to investigate why you have a suspected release by conducting a system tightness test within 30 days to determine if a leak does exist. The owner or operator must file a second report which contains a detailed description of the investigative procedures taken. It must also include the results of all tests or monitoring performed and be filed with the agency no later than 45 days after learning about the suspected release. You can use TCEQ's Release Determination Report form to fulfill this requirement of the second report. If there is a confirmed release, additional requirements and corrective action may be required by the remediation division. If you have a suspected release, keep all of your release detection records and any reports you have submitted to the TCEQ, including the initial incident report form and the second release determination report form. Any tightness testing requirements and documentation should also be kept proving that you are no longer experiencing a suspected release and the problem has been resolved. In the event of a confirmed release, the remediation division may require more information and request a corrective action plan to be submitted. 
any documentation of required corrective action taken should also be kept. This slide is a screenshot of the TCEQ Incident Report Form 20097. The top of the page has an email, phone number, and fax number to relay this information to the Remediation Division. They also have a phone number to call in case of an emergency. And this slide is a screenshot of the Release Determination Report Form 0621. This is the secondary report that should be submitted to the TCEQ within 45 days of learning about the suspected release. Facilities should also submit this form with their tightness test results. Okay, moving on to the construction and maintenance section. We will discuss the construction notification form and supporting records that could be kept in this part of the notebook. If you are going to conduct any work on your facility, such as tank installations, removals, repairs to an underground storage tank, you may need to submit a construction notification form. Investigators generally say if you are breaking concrete, you will most likely have to submit this form. It should be submitted at least 30 days prior to any work being done on your system. Remember, in addition to this requirement, you will also have to call the regional office one to three days before the work is scheduled. If you have any records of construction notifications, you can keep them in this section of the notebook. As far as records, keeping copies of the construction notification form to show that the correct documentation has been submitted before this work was initiated. And if your facility repairs or replaces any equipment, you can keep the receipts or invoices to document the new equipment that was installed. You're required to keep these records for five years. This slide is a construction notification acknowledgement letter notifying the facility that TCEQ received the construction notification form. This letter was for a tank installation and served as a temporary delivery authorization for 90 days. Once the facility construction is complete, they must submit a petroleum storage tank registration to receive their official delivery certificate. And this slide is a screenshot of the construction notification form 0495, which should be submitted 30 days prior to work being done on the system, along with that verbal notification to the facility's regional office one to three days prior. This form can also be submitted by mail or electronically in STEERS. Now we'll talk about the operator training requirements for underground storage tank facilities. This has been a requirement since 2012. Each facility needs to have an A, B, and C operator designated for each facility. A, B operators must receive training from an approved training provider on the TCEQ website because training providers had to update their courses to include the new rules that became effective May 2018. After the course, they will receive a training certificate and must be retrained every three years. All operators must know what to do in case of a spill, where the emergency shutoff is located, the contact information for the AB operator, and when to call 911. For operator training records, make sure you have an up-to-date AB operator certification, document proof of C operator training, and ensure one operator is on site during hours the facility is dispensing fuel. If you are considered an unmanned facility, you must have a sign that indicates the following information on this slide. 
what to do in case of a spill, where the emergency shutoff is located, when to call 911, and the contact information for the AV operator. If a facility was in significant non-compliance, they may have to retake operator training. If you need to retake operator training, be sure to keep those records. Your facility could also have an underground storage tank contractor serving as your AB operator, but you must have a signed written agreement that proves this. This slide is an example of an AB operator certificate. Just a side note that this is about a four hour course and the AB operator needs to be retrained every three years. This slide shows an example of a C operator training log. C operators can be trained by an AB operator for a facility regarding what to do if there's a spill, when to call 911, where the emergency shutoff is located, and the contact information for the AV operator. C operators should also be retrained every three years. We are going to discuss the requirements for facilities that may be temporarily out of service. As you can see on this slide, the facility is missing a dispenser and will probably be out of service for a while until they complete any necessary repairs. Another scenario might be that you bought a convenience store that also happened to have underground storage tanks, but you don't plan on selling gas or using the tanks at all. These are just a couple of examples when a facility could put their tank temporarily out of service. The TCEQ allows you to put your tanks temporarily out of service, but there are still requirements. What are these requirements? They include updating your registration within 30 days of the change in status from active to temporarily out of service. It's important to keep the vent lines open and functioning to allow the system to breathe and ensure the tank system is locked and secured. You must also maintain corrosion protection since you still have piping and tank components in the ground. And even though these tanks are temporarily out of service, you must still maintain your operator training for A, B, and C operators and retrain them every three years. Now, financial assurance is also required in case there's a release to the environment. You must have financial assurance unless you prove two things, that the system is empty, which according to 30 Texas Administrative Code, Chapter 334.54, there's a very specific definition of empty, stating that all liquid has been removed from the system and does not exceed 2.5 centimeters. The second requirement for removing your financial assur assurance is that you have conducted a site check in accordance with 30 Texas Administrative Code, Chapter 334.74. This is basically checking if there has been any releases to the environment or not. Only when your facility meets these two requirements can you remove your financial assurance. What if your facility is temporarily out of service but it's not empty. Then in addition to the requirements on the previous slide, you will also have additional requirements because you still have a regulated substance in your underground storage tank system. These facilities need to maintain their annual self-certification and registration, which is done using the TCE EQ form 0724 or electronically through STEERS. If you still have a regulated substance in an underground storage tank, you must also maintain the 30-day release detection records and the annual release detection equipment testing. And since there's potential for a release to the environment, any suspected releases should be reported to the TCEQ Remediation Division. 
On this slide, I tried to break down the requirements for empty and not empty temporarily at a service facilities. To verify that your facility is compliant, make sure you have the records that are applicable to you. If you have an empty underground storage tank that is temporarily at a service, look to the left of the screen. You need records for tank and pipe and corrosion protection, operator training, any empty documentation, and financial assurance. Remember that if you have an empty tank and proof of conducting a site check, only then can you remove your financial assurance. If your system is not empty, look to the right of the screen. You will need records to show your corrosion protection, operator training, financial assurance, annual self-certification, 30-day release detection records, annual release detection testing results, and documentation of any suspected releases. Last section of the Compliance Notebook addresses the requirements for gasoline vapor recovery throughout Texas. Since Stage 2 should be successfully decommissioned as of August 2018, we are only focusing on the Stage 1 requirements. When you look at the diagram on this slide, Focus on the left with the tanker track. This is stage one vapor recovery, which is a control strategy to capture gasoline vapors that are released when gasoline is delivered to a storage tank. The vapors are returned to the tank truck as the storage tank is being filled with fuel rather than the vapors being released to the air. Stage one requirements are based on the facility's location and the facility's monthly throughput of gas that is dispensed each month. There are certain counties that are listed as non-attainment for their air quality and have more strict requirements with this rule compared to attainment counties that have better air quality and fewer requirements. Depending on where you are located, and the gasoline dispensed each month, there are different requirements for controlling displaced vapor emissions. These requirements include inspecting for liquid leaks, visible vapors, or significant odors during gasoline fuel deliveries, having a submerged fill tube, vapor control system or vapor balance system, or conducting annual stage one testing and submitting the 6C certification for compliance. For more information on stage one requirements, please visit the vapor recovery webpage to determine your facility's requirement with this rule. There is also a map on the Stage 1 webpage that it includes each county and their Stage 1 requirements, depending on the gasoline that's dispensed each month. For Stage 1 documentation, keep records of the gasoline that is dispensed each month, like your 30-day inventory records. And depending on your location, you may need to verify compliance with applicable requirements. This could include documentation of the depth of your submerged fill tube or providing the annual stage one test results. You need to maintain any applicable records for two years. This slide shows an example of the stage one vapor recovery test for the pressure vacuum vent cap test. And here is an example of the stage one pressure decay test 102.1. And this slide is an example of the stage one vapor recovery test that includes both of these tests. The important aspect is that these test results say pass. 
That sums up the underground storage tank compliance notebook requirements and record keeping portion of the presentation. But we do have some resources available if you are looking for information about an underground storage tank facility. You can search the TCEQ central registry using the regulated entity number, customer number, or petroleum storage tank ID number. The central registry web address is on this slide. Alternatively, you can also contact the TCEQ regional office to look at your files. If you need help locating your regional office, you can contact the Small Business and Local Government Assistance Hotline and ask for assistance. A third option is contacting the Central File Room in Austin. You can submit a records request by email to review your file or request copies of your record. Keep in mind that you may have to pay for copies. If you are looking for blank petroleum storage tank forms, you can go to our forms webpage and search by a form number or keyword. This can be found on the TCEQ home webpage and click search forms. You can also use the link on this slide. If you would like additional assistance, you can always contact your regional small business and local government assistance staff to assist you. This information and other resources are available on our webpage, texasenvirohelp.org. Or if you would prefer, you can speak with the person in our section by calling the hotline number 1-800-447-2827. You can also email psthelp at tceq.text.gov. And that wraps up our webinar today. Thank you for attending our Underground Storage Tank Compliance Notebook webinar. If you have questions right now, please submit them in the Q&A box on the right-hand side of the screen, and we will be happy to answer them. Thank you, Becky. Uh, like Becky mentioned, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box and we will answer them in the order they are asked. I will also post a link to our survey in the Q&A and uh, you can take a few minutes, please, after the webinar to let us know how we did and if we can improve the webinar itself. Uh, but before we get to it, the questions on Becky's presentation, we did have a question come in for Rachel. So um, Melanie posted, can you go over slide 30 again? Specifically, can you explain the cathodic protection types a little more? Yes, okay, I, I can do my best to try to explain the different types of um, cathodic. Uh, protection system. So it looks like Becky may be trying to pull up that slide for me. Thank you so much, Becky. Um, so yeah, so on that slide, it discussed the, the two different types and the testing frequencies. Um, so to my understanding, the, the two types, the galvanic system and the impressed current system, so they both attach anodes to the system, I think in a similar way, but basically with the galvanic systems, the anodes are attached to um, metal components on your system so that the anode will take on the corrosion instead of that metal component on your system. Um, and then the impressed current system, again, those anodes are, are attached throughout the system, but um, they are, attached to the rectifier and that rectifier will send an electrical current out to the system um, to kind of create a, a buffer or shield of some sort that will inhibit uh, the corrosion of metal metal components um, and so that's why it's very important to inspect that six, that uh, rectifier every 60 days um, so that you can 
ensure that the rectifier is sending out the correct electrical current that is actually protecting your system. Um, if it's not sending out the, the correct electrical current, you your system may start corroding when it shouldn't be. Um, so I hope I hope that kind of explains it. And that's why also, you know, having a corrosion specialist or corrosion technician um, it, uh, test your, your system, that cathodic protection system, uh, three to six months after installation, and then every three years is just to ensure that everything is operating properly and that those anodes are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, more information about this is found, you can actually find it in our super guide. Um, I believe it is module F for where it's talking about uh, protecting your UST from corrosion. Um, but if you have any questions about your specific system, I would recommend reaching out to a corrosion specialist or technician to, to talk with them about what's going on with your system or if anything about it needs to change. But that's that's my understanding of the two different types of cathodic protection. So I hope that answers your question. If not, please email us at the PSC help at tceq.texas.gov and we can talk to you about it more. Thank you so much, Rachel. OK, Becky, we have a couple of questions that have come in. Can you explain stage one and to vapor recovery info again? Sure. Um, so let me first start with stage two. Stage two is no longer required. It was a requirement um, up until September 2018 when um, TCEQ um, adopted some EPA rules where they determined that onboard vehicle vapor recovery systems were widely used. So it was no longer required for gas stations to have stage two uh, vapor recovery at the pump. So those should have been decommissioned. Um, maybe it was August 2018. I forget, but I know in 2018 um, we required that to be decommissioned. So um, that no longer is a requirement. However, stage one is still a requirement and those rules were kind of coupled together. So we made sure to, to emphasize that stage one is still a requirement, but that is based off of um, your county that you're located in because that uh, determines the air quality in your area. Um, and the gasoline monthly throughput. So how much gasoline is dispensed each month, which you can determine with your inventory control um, or sales or sale records. Um, but basically with those two numbers, uh, sorry, the number of the gasoline dispensed each month and then the county are located and determine which stage one regulations apply. Um, and so, you know, if you have questions about that applicability to your system, you can email PST help. Uh, we can look at the um, stage one vapor recovery map and see what your county, you know, what your county regulations are. Because if you're in a poor air quality area um, that's considered non attainment, um, you you do have to do stage one and so up until like all of the requirements of stage one um, no matter what your throughput is but there's a lot of nuances to that rule uh, there there's some exceptions with within that even so I would recommend if you're not sure about stage one requirements or what applies to you please email PST help so we can make sure we answer um, specific to your facility Hope that hope that answers that question. <laughs> a long winded answer. <laughs> Thanks, Becky. Mm -hmm. um, OK, we have another question. Shannon asks if spill prevention equipment is repaired, can the required test within 30 days be done on the day of repair or is an additional test required? Um, I think it, it's just the rule says within 30 days. So as long as the test is done, um, it may depend on the type of repair. 
um, if you're replacing, I'm guessing you talked about spill containment. So um, if it's replacing a spill bucket, but um, we can verify that with the investigators in the area too, depending on what records they typically review. But I, I think it's um, within, because it, because it says within 30 days of the repair. So that to me sounds like it's within 30 days, um, but it might depend on the type of equipment you are repairing. And then we want to go to the rule and verify that that is correct. So, and then also checking with regional investigators that that is acceptable when they go out in an investigation. So, um, I I uh, suggest email PST help. <laughs> I'm suggesting to email PST help um, just to verify what type of equipment. I need a little bit more time to look into that that rule to see um, if it if that would indeed qualify for that testing within 30 days of the repair. Sorry, I can't give you a clear answer. <laughs> Need a little bit more research on that one. Okay, uh, another question we have, do we need to paint the lids of storage tanks? Um, I'm not sure the lid of the storage tank, if you're talking about the fill port or the fill tube. Um, uh, the color coordinating, I, I don't think that is us, um, but we do require labeling um, based off of how you identify the, the tanks in your registration. Um, that might be something Rachel can touch more on, but um, yeah, Rachel, I don't know if you have more to add on that. Yeah, I was trying to look up um, if there was a specific rule that mentioned it. I do know that there are, you know, yeah, the color coordinated or color coded paints that you could do to indicate if it's, you know, diesel or unleaded. Um, and so I do know those are very specific requirements if you're going to, or very specific colors, I guess, if you're going to do that. I'm not. And then yes, if you if you are in some way indicating like labeling your tank using some sort of paint, um, you need to make sure that if you're painting your tank as far as um, to match your registration, you'll need to keep updating that to make sure it's legible and permanent. Um, you don't want any sort of like spray painted numbers to to fade away over time. Um, so I, I can't think of anything else to add, though. I'm not sure if, if that's our requirement to color code the lids according to the product. I'd have to look more into that. Yeah, and I, I think it might be OSHA. Um, I'm not entirely sure, but that's that's what I'm finding for painting the, the color coding, like the green, red, yellow, that kind of thing, um, if that's what they're talking about. But what we, uh, yeah, what Rachel said is like labeling, based off of the registration. So there's different ways to label and one way is to paint it, but you have to make sure that you continuously paint it so it doesn't wear away. But that's the tank ID. That's not the color coding. So. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool, okay, <laughs> thanks. Okay, thank you ladies. We really appreciate you and uh, thank you everyone for attending today's How to Prepare for a UST Investigation webinar. If you haven't yet, please complete our survey, which I've linked in the chat. Your survey and attendance responses help us produce better webinars in the future. If we did not answer your questions today, or you think of more, please email us at psthelp at tcq.texas.gov. Thank you again and have a wonderful rest of your day.